This morning, we find ourselves continuing in the Gospel of John. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood the true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts, minds, and souls to your movement that in the waters of our own baptisms, we may see the change and transformation you promised us always. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So before I um, launch into our sermon today, um, I want to actually read the reading that I'm going to be preaching on. Um, as I was pre prepping this week, it wasn't the gospel that spoke to me, but um, the interpretation of the gospel that the writer of the letter to the Ephesians um, has. So if you look in your bulletin, there's a little leaflet with the scripture on it. So let me just read the second reading. It's only five verses long. A reading from the letter to the Ephesians. Be careful how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. As you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times, and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you may be wondering why that spoke to me, but let me tell you. Um, so what struck me in that section from Ephesians um, is the, the idea of living wisely. You know, we're compelled as Christians to be wise people in a world that is very unwise. Um, but then that raises the question of, well, what wisdom do we hold that is different from the world? What is different from the wisdom that we interpret that we get from God versus the wisdom we see in the world? It, it ties into what the will of God is. You know, as Christians, what do we believe God's will for us is and for the world? And for me, I understand what the will of God is and how the church has interpreted that through what we do here at this font in our baptismal water. This is where we have professed um, a belief in God and how we understand God moving in the world. And that movement, that change that we talk, we hear in the song that we opened with, this transformation, it happens in our baptism. It's not something that we intrinsically can bring on ourselves. It's done by the Spirit in this moment. This is where we are changed from people of the world to people of God's kingdom. So for that reason, I want us to look through the baptismal covenant together since we'll be affirming it together today. And let's explore what that looks like for Christians. So in your pew back, there's either red or black books with a gold cross on it. Pull it out. This is the Book of Common Prayer. It's our worship book for the Episcopal Church. I know you didn't think you'd have to mess with books today, right? And turn to page 304. So on this page, 304, this is the baptismal covenant that after the sermon, we will all be affirming and committing to or recommitting to again. Um, so before we launch into a quick question. How many of us are baptized? Good amount of us. How many of us were baptized outside of the Episcopal Church? 
Okay, that's what I thought. So I, th this is what the clarifying that I want to do before we launch into this. <laughs> For a lot of us, we're baptized in Lutheran tradition, Catholic, Baptist, non-denominational. In the Episcopal Church, oh, thank you for that, I like that. In the Episcopal Church, we understand that one baptism stands in for all people. So it doesn't matter where you were baptized. If you were baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that baptism is valid. And for us, these vows, whether they were named explicitly or implicitly in that baptism, we have affirmed these. We have committed ourselves to these. So whether this is the first time you've ever seen these or it's the hundredth time, these are the commitments and affirmations we've made to God. So let's walk through them, shall we, and see how our wisdom is a little bit different from the world. And I want to look at the first three together. Um, and if you're joining us online, you've got it on your screen. Or if you want, you can go to Book of Common Prayer online. Um, the first three. Do you believe in God the Father? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? And do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? Now, the powerful thing about our baptismal vows is that they build upon one another. So the first section is the foundation. This is what fundamentally makes us different than everything else just makes us even more different and more different from the world. But in these three vows, this is the foundation of who we are as Christians. This is what makes us different from the world. Now, correct me if y'all have experienced differently, but most of the time what I hear and am taught outside of the church is if you can't see it, if you can't taste it, if you can't hear it, if you can't touch it, it's not real. If you can't find the facts for it, if I cannot observe it and someone else can observe it, it doesn't exist. Well, this vow fundamentally makes us different because we are affirming that we are not the center of the universe. We are not the center of creation, that there is a holiness, a God that is beyond this, that created all of this and is sustaining it. And the reason why I want us to look at these three together is because it talks about how we understand God's presence in the world. We understand that God created the heavens and created the earth and continues to create. There is this continuous creation that happens all the way through. So a God that is always creating. And we believe in God in the person of Jesus. We believe in a God that was so loving and is so loving that God came down and took on flesh and bone and experienced life as we experience it. Think on that for a moment. A God that knows the joys of having a child, knows the joys of your friends doing something silly and saying they're laughing at them, knows the pains of losing a loved one, knows the uncomfortableness of stubbing a toe, we have a God that experienced life as we have experienced it and showed us by crossing over that veil that we call death, that death isn't an end, but merely a continuation into a deeper, more eternal life. And we also affirm in this, in the third vow, God and the Holy Spirit. We understand that God did not just create and then was done. We do not believe in a God that just came down and experienced life once and then left and left it alone. We believe in God who is present with us, that moves, is constantly present in this world. God's work is still being done and things are shifting and changing. So, does that sound a little bit different from the world outside? So that builds into the next vow. Will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship? in the breaking of bread, and in the prayers. Now, this is where that wisdom of God, our understanding of uh, a holy God, deepens. Because you see out in the world, again, correct me if y'all experience differently, but I think our society and our culture is very eye-focused, isn't it? What do I need to do to get to the next step? How are things impacting me? You know, gas prices, they're, I'm worried about it for me, not other people. It's the, this eye-focused centrality, and we pull away from being around others. It's all about us. But yet, in this vow, God's wisdom that we affirm is that there's power in what we do here, in community. In gathering together as people, this is where the power and the strength of the world is. This is where true love and God's true presence is. It's in us coming together to worship together, to break bread together, to know one another, and to learn. That's a vital part of this vow. 
to continue in the apostles' teaching intrinsically is us saying that we're not perfect. There's never one moment in our life where we have it all figured out, where we've learned everything, and you know, we're just living life you know, easy after that. Here, we are acknowledging against the world that this is a life of continuous learning. It is learning that has to take place with others, because that's how we're going to learn. Right? And then that vow builds upon the next one. And this one's my favorite vow. Will you persevere in resisting evil, and whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord? Now, you might be thinking, well, maybe Reverend Grant likes this because he likes fighting evil, like a superhero. <laughs> but that's not why I love this vow. I love the second portion of this vow, and I think that's the point that's being put in here. It doesn't say, if ever you fall into sin. It says, whenever. In the moment in our baptism, in every moment of our lives after our baptism, we have already affirmed to God that, hey, guess what, God? I'm not you, and I'm going to screw it up sometime. We're acknowledging our limitedness, and that's okay. We're acknowledging that we're not perfect, that we're going to stumble, and we're going to struggle with this commitment and struggle with being different from the world. And God's response to that is, that's okay. Return to me. Come get your strength, your wholeness, your solace from me. There's a beautifulness in this because it's us giving permission to ourselves and affirming what God has already told us, that we have forgiveness from God, and that it's okay for us to forgive ourselves when we stumble. And it's okay to forgive others when they stumble in relation to us. Isn't that freeing to know that you don't have to be God? I don't know about y'all, but I find that freeing. And this is so important because the next three vows, I feel like you need to know about that forgiveness to get to it. Because the next one is, will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God, Christ? What this vow is moving us to is it's more than just us acknowledging it internally. But once we've affirmed this difference, once we have taken this on as ourselves, we acknowledge that it changes us. And it, it, it elicits a change in our behavior in the world. It means that rather than looking exactly like every single person outside of the church body, Instead of being hateful and vengeful and self-focused, our bodies, our lives, what we do, what we say, reflect the ministry of Jesus. Our bodies will be different. Our deeds will be different because we'll be more loving, kind, more gracious, more forgiving, more generous. Our deeds will be ones that show us giving up of ourselves to serve others. That's a little bit different from the world, isn't it? Not go along with what the crowd is, but to go against the grain, be different, be more loving in a world that is built, be more forgiving in a world that is vengeful, be a presence of peace and healing in a world that is sick and in need. It's a powerful difference in God's wisdom versus the world's wisdom. And then that moves us into the next vow. And I affirm this one. I love this vow too. And this is the one I struggle with the most. But maybe you do too. Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? You see why this vow might be one of the hardest ones to do? What Jesus is called to, like, like what we affirm that we are called to as Christians, what we are affirming here in this vow, is that we know that God loves all people. Equally, no matter who they are or what they do, God loves them because they are a child of God. And in this vow, we are different from the world because we affirm that the face of Jesus is in every single person in here. That means each and every single person in here reflects Christ out into the world. It means that those neighbors that we live around and we might not understand, they reflect the face of Jesus. It means that those that we love in our families, our friends, those, um, maybe our coworkers that were kind of like, oh, they're a little annoying. I don't want to talk to them on Monday. They have Jesus inside of them. It means that the people that we fundamentally don't understand or disagree with or just really have a hard time being around and agreeing with, it means that 
Jesus is in them too. That's hard. To love someone that you don't know, don't understand, that you disagree with. I think we got a lot of disagreement going on in our world today, don't we? Especially in our country. But what this vow says and what we affirm, this is what makes us so different from the world is that we are called to love them despite our own issues. And it's not this kind of love where you share with a spouse, this loving, you know, um, close thing that you have that's a biological movement. And it's not a love that you share with your friends of I really vibe with you so I, I can build a relationship with you. It's a love that the Greeks call agape. And what they mean by agape is a love that is intentional. A love that says, I recognize in you a fundamental piece of God. And because I recognize that, I am going to give of myself to the most to be good to you, to seek the most benefit for you, to be the most kind. It's an intentional love. It's a love that we see in the ministry of Jesus when he went out and healed the sick and made the lame walk and reached out to the outcast and overturned systems that were unjust to people. There was this going out and giving of himself to the world to make it better. Even if he didn't like the people. God calls us to love people, not like them. And that's hard, isn't it? And yet, as Christians, we are called to be different in the world like that's why I appreciate the vow that says that it's okay to stumble, because I stumble with this a lot. But this wisdom is different from the world that would want us to separate ourselves from one another. How easy is it in the world to unfriend someone that we disagree with politically? How easy is it for us to just avoid that side of town because I don't understand that culture that lives over there, or I am scared of the people of a darker skin color than I? How easy is it for us to segregate ourselves off politically, economically, culturally. It's so easy to do that in the world, and we, we're taught to do that subconsciously and consciously, and yet God's wisdom that we have affirmed is that we break down those barriers. We love. And that builds to the final vow that we do in our baptism. Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human? And this is a continuation of all these other vows. They all build up to this. It's not enough just to affirm it for ourselves. It's not enough for us to affirm it in the community around us and in our one-on-one -on -one relationships. Our difference is meant to be a cosmic, a global shift too as a, as a whole church. As the church, we are called to seek justice in the world. And when we hear justice, this wisdom is meaning rather than us sitting back and being comfortable with how systems benefit us and not worrying about how they hurt other people, we seek to build a community that is good for all people and respects all people. It means that when we live in a culture and in a society where our justice system demonizes people of color, and overwhelmingly pushes them in prison. We as Christians are called to God's justice to tear down that system and be a system to help raise systems that are more just for people. It means that when we go out shopping and we buy these very cheap but lovely clothes that we love, we might think about the children who are making those clothes halfway around the world. And maybe we might think differently about how we clothe ourselves. I could sit here all day and give you whole examples of this. But the idea is that we care for people and we love our neighbors, not just those that we see and interact with, but our neighbors all across the world. And how do our actions impact them and theirs impact us? So basically, to boil all this down, I know that was really heady, so thank you for going with me on it. Um, but I think it's important for us to talk about these because that, that is what makes a wise life versus an unwise life. As Christians, this is what we've affirmed is God's will. This is that wisdom that we feel we have been called to and we seek to change into every single day in our baptism. 
it comes down to one simple statement that Jesus gives in the Gospel of John. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another just as I loved you. Friends, we are called to love. We're not called to hate or to put up with or tolerate. We are called to love people, to seek the good for all people, to be a change in the world, to be a light that's not there. We're called to go out into the world and be changed, to help lead others into the baptismal waters that we've experienced and show them the healing and the transformation that happens there. And so with that in mind, we're about to baptize a new member into this family. And as we do that, when we get to the point where we are saying these vows together, where we're praying them together, I invite you to seriously ponder what these vows are and what they mean for us. Think of how the Spirit has changed you because of your baptism. And how is the Spirit moving you to even deeper change in the world around? Amen.